because everyone goes, great, quick nap. Uh, don't have a nap. Uh, raise your hand, just squeeze your, your left ear as hard as you can. Raise your hand if it hurt. Fantastic. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no, no, that's not true. Let me tell you a story. Uh, I just want to take that off the screen for the moment. Uh, I want to tell you a story that will explain to you the first three years of the neurobiology of pain that you would study at university. Eight years ago, I was walking in the bush. I had a sarong on. <laughs> Very cool. This is what happened. Did you see that? <laughs> Hang on. This is what happened. Biologically, I'm going to tell you what happened just then. Something touched the outside of my left leg in the skin. That activates receptors on the end of big, fat, myelinated, fast-conducting nerve fibres. And they stream straight up my leg, straight into my spinal cord, up to this part of my brain. And they say, you've just been touched on the outside of your left leg in the skin. <laughs> Meanwhile, whatever it was is sufficiently intense to activate free nerve endings. We call them nociceptors. They're thin, unmyelinated, slow-conducting Lada Neva. Someone knows what a Lada Neva is. <laughs> nerve fibres and that message travels up to my spinal cord and it gets to my spinal cord and that's as far as it goes. And it says to an, a fresh neuron in my spinal cord, uh, you've just been, uh, something dangerous has happened on the outside of your left leg in the skin, <laughs> mate. <laughs> and the spinal nociceptor takes that message up to the thalamus which sits in there somewhere and says, uh, there's danger on the outside of your left leg in the skin, mate. <laughs> Now the brain has to evaluate how dangerous this really is. So it looks at everything. And the way that I make sense of this, of what happened to me, is the brain thought, frontal lobe, have we been ever anywhere like this before? Hang on, I'll just ask the posterior parietal cortex. <laughs> have we been in this environment before? Yes, we have. <laughs> has it happened at this stage of the gait cycle? Yes, it has. Is it coming from the same location? Yes, it is. What is it? Well, your whole life growing up, you used to scratch your legs on twigs. This is not dangerous. I'm going to give you, the organism, just something so you can kick off the twig and con continue on your merry way. And that's what happened to me. I can't show you now, but I took off my sarong, <laughs> got in the river, got out of the river, and that's the last thing I remember, uh, having been bitten by an eastern brown snake. Survivor. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> now, for some reason, the eastern brown snake works by, by poisoning you, clearly, and one of the things that it does is activates nerve fibres. So, actually, my brain would have got all these messages saying, danger, 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 danger. And in its wisdom, it said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Six months later, I'm walking in the bush with a boring talker. You know what a boring talker is? Those people, it doesn't matter what they say, it's boring. That's irrelevant, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll call her Naomi, because that is her name. Anyway, this is what happened, right? Oh, wah! And I am in agony. I have got a white hot poke of pain screaming up my leg. I'll tell you biologically what's happened. Something touched the outside of my left leg in the skin. That activates big fat myelinated nerve fibres, which send a message up to here. Just me touching the outside of your left leg in the skin. <laughs> it's sufficiently intense to activate these free nerve endings, danger receptors. Take the message to my spinal cord. Just been, uh, something dangerous has happened on the outside of your left leg in the skin. Yeah. <laughs> well done, you weren't planted. That goes to the thalamus and says the same thing. Something dangerous has just happened on the outside of your left leg in the skin. Right. So the brain says, thanks very much, thalamus. Kids are right? Good. Anyway, uh, <laughs> frontal cortex, anything to tell me about this? Hang on, I'll ask the posterior parietal cortex. Where are we? We're walking in the bush. Oh. <laughs> You're a bit mate happy. <laughs> uh, this stage of the gait cycle, where's it coming from? Have we been here before? Oh, yes, we have. Last time we were here, you almost died. <laughs> I'm going to make this hurt so much that you can do nothing else. And I was in absolute agony for what seemed like minutes, screaming pain, until one of my mates looked at my leg and there's a little scratch from a twig. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
the pain in those situations was totally different because of meaning. I want to try and convince you that pain is an illusion 100% of the time. Here's a visual illusion. So if you have a look at this picture, you've got a square that's got A in it and a square that's got B in it. Raise your hand if you think that the square with A in it looks darker than the square with B in it. Thank goodness for that. You're, none of you have a really socially embarrassing neurological disorder, <laughs> except you. <laughs> uh, that's not true. Uh, but watch what happens if we have another look at this. These are those two squares taken out of that picture. And hopefully you can see that they're identical, and some of you may not believe me, so I'll just put A on top of that, and uh, I'll put B on top of that. And some of you may still not believe me, so why don't we just uh, move A over on top of B? or B over on top of A. No matter how long you look at this, A will look darker than B because your brain's doing some really groovy stuff. Really quickly, outside of your awareness. Have a look at this. Turn your head on the side and have a look at the same picture. Nothing changes. <laughs> Fantastic, 100% tape. <laughs> so what really happens here the, exactly the same frequency is hitting your retina and that sends a message to the back of the brain. And then all of this groovy stuff happens very quickly to ask the question, what does this really mean? What's biologically advantageous for me? And then you get a visual image. This is a visual illusion. And vision's not about emotion, vision's not necessarily about survival, but pain is. Now, some of you might not know if you're not medically trained, but what's happening at this guy's leg, right leg, that's not right. That's, <laughs> that's a dangerous situation. And that danger message arrives at the brain and the brain has to ask exactly the same question. What does this mean? What should be done here? And hopefully, the orchestra in this person's brain will make your leg hurt. In the work that I've been doing for a long time, we, we're trying our best to work out how do we convince people in pain that we understand they're in pain, but it's not just about the tissues of their body. How do we convince them of that? And a key conceptual shift that we think is really important is that you can understand that pain is the end result. Pain's an output of the brain designed to protect you. It's not something that comes from the tissues of your body. There's, no, there's nothing there. You get, we show patients a, a really sharp knife and we say, this knife is sharp, yeah? Yeah. And it might be a bit cold, yeah? And it's hard. It's got all those properties. Is this knife painful as it sits out there? No, it's not. That knife does not have the properties of pain. And when you stick it into their belly, we do this regularly, straight through. <laughs> the belly doesn't d adopt the property of pain. The brain has to do some very rapid and groovy things to project this illusion that pain exists there. 100% of the time, pain is a construct of the brain. We can mess with pain really easily without touching the tissues. This is an experiment we did a while ago where we got supposedly normal, healthy volunteers. They're not normal people because they're volunteering for a pain experiment. <laughs> but let's say they're, they're reasonably normal, right? And we put a very cold piece of metal on the back of their hand and we just show them one of two lights. One light is red and one light is blue. We don't tell them anything about the lights, we just show them the light. <laughs> I see that hand. Um, and we ask them, how much does it hurt? And if they see the red light, it hurts more than if they see the blue light. The stimulus is exactly the same. What's different is the meaning of the stimulus. Now there's a cue that says, this is really hot, because red means hot. So the sensible brain, the clever brain, should say, well, I really don't want you to do it. So I'm going to make it really hurt. These people in the States are allowed to get their psychology students to participate in experiments in exchange for credit points or sex or something. <laughs> um, anyway, they put their head inside what they think is a stimulator for their head and they make sure that the subject can see the intensity knob. And as they turn up the intensity knob, this picture, the little figure there, showing the lines going up at a steady rate, that's their reported head pain. And it matches the intensity knob. But the stimulator's doing nothing. It's just one of those old-fashioned plastic hair dryers that doesn't do anything. Yeah, you know those things? Yeah, you probably use one. <laughs> yeah. The trick is that they have to see the intensity knob. 
And I always think it'd be fun to do an experiment based on that Spinal Tap film where the intensity knob goes up to 11. <laughs> Remember that film? What's really important from a clinical perspective, and I'm, I'm a clinical neuroscientist and I see patients in pain, any piece of credible in, uh, evidence that they're in danger should change their pain. And they're all walking into hospital departments with models like this on the desk. What does your brain say when it sees a disc that's slipped so far out it's sitting on its own? <laughs> if you've ever seen a disc in a cadaver, you can't slip the suckers. They're, they're immobile. You can't slip a disc. But that's our language and it messes with your brain. It cannot not mess with your brain. We can even modulate the location of pain. We can do some groovy things. Um, it's quite well established that referred pain gives you, it gives you pain in an area of your body that might be physiologically normal. And most of you would have heard of referred pain. Bless you. Uh, we do experiments where we give you pain in an artificial limb. It's not even yours. This is Meng, who was a postdoc in my lab in Oxford in the UK, and we stole a prosthetic limb, which is a whole other story, which is really <laughs> funny. Uh, but I won't tell it to you. And we, we can do this manipulation so that you start to feel like the plastic limb in front of you is yours. And we can make the rubber hand hurt. And we can bring in a knife <coughs> uh, and, and run the knife across the rubber hand and you have your brain responses to protect that rubber hand. You're feeling pain in, in a lump of plastic, effectively. Here's a groovy experiment where we take uh, two Microsoft clip art people and we put <laughs> uh, a webcam on the forehead of one of them and a set of uh, virtual reality glasses on the other one. Uh, and then we get them to shake hands, and as they're shaking hands, the person on your right, who's wearing the goggles, their visual field is coming from the other person's forehead. Have you got it? So they are effectively looking at the other person, thinking it's them, because they're shaking hands, the motor command fits, everything's good. Uh, and then we come in and put a painful stimulus on that person's arm and they see it hit the arm of the person over there with whom they're shaking hands. And they, and they say, ouch, it really hurts. And we say, where does it hurt? On that man's arm. <laughs> and they get it right every time. They point exactly where it is. But if you're an outside taking a photo of that, they're literally, we've got the painful stimulus here and they're saying, it hurts there. So the brain is, pro is not only producing pain, it's projecting it to this location in, in midair. We can mess with that. This all becomes really important when pain persists because two things happen when pain persists that make the life of someone in pain really difficult, that cost our country $40 billion a year, cost Australia more than cancer, cardiovascular disease and diabetes combined. Thanks for that facial expression. I wanted someone to go... This is the problem, that if we keep running the neurons, the brain cells that produce pain, they get better at producing pain. They become more and more sensitive, so we need a smaller and smaller influence. The illusion, if you like, an increase in sensitivity, becomes very unhelpful. It's trying to protect you from something that, that's not needing protection. It's very real. The other thing that happens is that all of these networks lose their capacity to be specific and precise, so the pain spreads. The pain changes its quality. Ultimately, it's, it's not even informative. It's both unhelpful and uninformative. Maybe the next TED talk ever uh, is the really important question, what do we do about it? Who knows? But uh, <laughs> no, we do know. That's what we're really researching, but that's the end of my 18 minutes. Thank you very much for having me. It was cool.